Just talk amongst yourselves for a second. We tested this before and it just worked. <laughs> there you are, see? No Brilliant. problem. Thank you very much. Okay, so Adam Field from the University of Southampton and this guy you might have heard of. That's fine. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Uh, yeah, let me just press play so I've got a timer here. Hooray. Okay, um, so we've been working for a little while on putting tweets in repository, and this, this, um, this, this exists in a, in a broader context, and Les is going to talk about that because he's kind of been leading the direction of this project where I've been focusing on the coding and the architecture, so we decided to split the presentation that way. And kind of context comes first, so Les will really come first, so I'm not really sure why I started. But, um, because, because you're the one who actually knows what's going on, that's why. Okay, um, shall, shall we get the burning bus yes, up? Yes, let's get the burning bus up. All right. So uh, this, kind, this is the con... Oh, beg your pardon. So this is the context for the, uh, for the work that we're doing, uh, which is uh, an, an image uh, from the London riots. Uh, and shall I, shall I stand over here? Which is an image if from the... If you're muted, it would be all right. Okay, is that all right? I haven't got my glasses yes, on. You can stay now wherever you want. Beg your pardon. Right. Um, so the context of this uh, is um, some work that happened, not um, anything that we did, uh, in the London riots. Uh, I, read a, I read a book um, uh, that's, that a, uh, a sociologist uh, uh, had uh, published about the evidence of you know, what the causes of the London riots were. Uh, and uh, it was... Uh, it, it was sort of very interesting. He'd, he'd done some, some serious analysis uh, by looking at, by doing a number of things, uh, interviewing people. But he said in his book that the most important source of information they had was, uh, was videos that, that the participants had posted on YouTube of what was going on, not necessarily people who were, who were participating with rioting, but passers-by or whatever. So they had uh, they put things up on YouTube of what was going on. Uh, and he, that was the most most important uh, part of the uh, of the study for him, but what he found was that people were taking those things offline very quickly because they were worried of the consequences of having posted them, that the police would come and you know sort of think they were uh, ringleaders. So um, so he found that you know sort of the web, uh, social media was this incredibly rich set of in, uh, source of information for his research, but it was incredibly ephemeral. Um, and um, you know, sort of, we're used in the you know, sort of preservation. We're used to the idea that things will go away eventually, but it will be our fault. We're not used to the idea that things will be sort of kind of come and then go away very quickly. That they're they're quite as you know, sort of ephemeral as that. And so, I really wanted to do something uh, uh, that that helped that that worked on that. Um, uh, part of my job now is to run a doctoral training centre in, in web science. We have a lot of big interdisciplinary activities lots of social scientists looking at social media um, and uh, one of the one of the key parts of that for them is, is Twitter because it's very accessible it, it's the uh, you know it's easy to get hold of so there's a lot of work going on um, on Twitter and we really wanted to do something you know Twitter is a fantastic example of some social media that's here today and gone tomorrow and we needed to be able to collect make large-scale collections of um, tweets uh, around events, you know, and so you know, so the the London riots uh, and the Occupy activities, things that are socially important, um, also like you know Doctor Who, um, uh, the comments that people make uh, about things, you know, sort of internationally, you can see you see people's attitudes, you get a get a lot from these, given you know the the constraints, uh, and so that, and when we saw that, oh look, this is data that's here and goes away, this sounds very much like preservation. This is something a repository can do, you know. Let's try, let's see if we can help people because they understand repositories, they use repositories. Um, let's see if we can extend the repository to, to be useful in this area. And this is where Adam mm -hmm. comes in and, and I leave. The power of the microphone. Got no whistle now, Les. Um, right, so, so uh, we built a harvester. Um, our first it so, so this is our first iteration of, of the harvesting part of the system. Um, so we're only 
uh, connecting to the Twitter search API, which is a kind of a, a, a they don't, it's very simple. You don't need to authenticate. Um, there, for all intents and purposes, isn't really an API limit. They say there is one, but they don't publish it. I'm not sure whether there is one or not, um, but we've never really had a problem. Um, the, the, I guess the key issue with it is that you can only go back 1,500 tweets on the search API for any given search. Um, but you, for, for our purposes, this, this, has, this has been enough. So the, kind of the, the, the strategy we ended up with was to hit the search API every 20 minutes um, and download JSON from, uh, from, from, uh, from Twitter's API. Um, there are libraries out there, but they're quite heavyweight, so we just, we just made a request for some JSON, and then we had something that was nicely processable. Um, and as Les said, we want, to, we want to preserve this in the repository, not only for our system, but as we were doing this work, people started coming out of the woodwork who had written, we were a computer science department, and somebody said, yeah, I wrote a harvester, I've got, I've got five million tweets over here um, that I don't know what to do with. So putting the infrastructure in the repository for this is important beyond the scope of harvesting from Twitter, because we have a lot of tweets kicking around the place that we didn't harvest, and it would be really useful to have these in one place so that when these PhD students who have written these little harvesters and collected this stuff and put them in a database or in some files in their own formats when they leave, these resources persist. So, um, yes, this is one of the boring slides. This is our first architecture that we wrote. We, we, we went with, with a very simple method and said, okay, so a set of tweets that's kind of like a document. Let's just put it all in a document uh, which exists under an ePrint. So in, in ePrints, which is the platform we happen to use, that's the one we know best, um, a document can have any number of files. And the usual reason for this is because HTML documents have any number of files. Um, so what we would do is we would, we would harvest from Twitter Every time we'd hit the search API, every 20 minutes, we'd create an XML file underneath the document that contains the results of that harvest. And then we would process those to create HTML files, which were long lists of tweets with an index file that were relatively browsable. Um, there was a flaw in this plan, which I'll come to in a minute. I, I, I'm sure if you think about it for more than five minutes, you'll spot it. Um, and we ended up with a page that looked like this, which was the way to access this data. So at the top left, and I actually I stood at various points in this room yesterday to see where people could see this. And I don't think people at the back can see it very well, but about two thirds of the way up the room, you should be OK. Um, but in the top left, we have a standard ePrint abstract page, which has a single document uh, which is listed as HTML. And if you click on that, you get the top right, which is a long list of links to pages containing tweets. Um, and then you click on one of those links, and you get a page that shows you a list of actual tweets. And we thought this was amazing. You could click on the links. You can, you can uh, uh, follow things. Uh, and we thought, wow, that's brilliant. But it turns out it wasn't particularly brilliant. Uh, we had enormous scaling issues. If you can imagine we're hitting the search API every 20 minutes, when we've been doing this for about six months, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of XML files under one ePrint, and thousands and thousands of HTML files. And as a, a, a quirk of ePrints is that it would check the file size of every, docu of every file inside the document before rendering it to the screen, which would take about 30 minutes. Um, so somebody came to me one day and said, it's broken. It just doesn't work. Nothing appears on the screen. Um, and that was why. So we had to take another approach. But we realized that the system was also quite limited. We were presenting tweets as, well, as tweets. But tweets aren't just tweets. Tweets are quite structured, detailed data. This is, uh, this is one of our tweets that we have. This was about the Oscars. Um, and we have a number of, this is JSON for those of you who aren't programmers, which is structured data, 
uh, with a key and a value. And you can see there's actually quite a bit of data there. There's quite a bit of interesting things that we can, uh, uh, we can extract and play with. And if we make the repository aware of these and store them in the database separately, we have a much richer object and we can do a lot more with it. So we had our second design iteration, which treated tweets as first-class repository objects, but also the tweet stream object, which is the collection object, which I guess could be boiled down to the search that you do that returns these results. These are also first-class objects. And I've shown two of them up here because a couple of the tweets in this diagram belong to two separate tweet streams. So we only have to store the tweet once now for it to appear in multiple tweet streams, whereas before we had to store it twice, which is a, a, a slightly purer way to do it, and it gives a slight space saving, but I don't think it's really very significant. And what we could do with that, once we had this data, is we could aggregate and we could make a much nicer landing page for a tweet stream. So this is the uh, OR2012 tweets um, as of about two days ago. And you can see William Nixon is almost leading the charge. Um, I actually can do a kind of a, a live demo of this now. Um, although, is that all on the screen? It's not really, is it? Let's try, let's try uh, full screening it again. How do you do that? I knew there would be a flaw. Right. So we have, on the left, we have a list of the oldest tweets and then a kind of a paper tear, and then a list of the newest tweets coming down to the most recent one we have when this page was regenerated. This page is being regenerated every 30 minutes past the hour, and the harvesting is happening every 20 minutes. Um, so Keita Bando, who is also one of the top tweeters, it doesn't show as well because he's actually tweeting from two different accounts. Um, so he's, I, I think he might actually be winning, but it doesn't look like he is. Sorry, William. Um, and then we, w what we can do is to give people a feel for what this tweet stream is, we can pull out some of the data and aggregate it from the tweets so that we have, I guess, something pretty to look at, but also some initial analysis of the tweet stream so people can, at a glance, see an overview of what it's about. So we have who's been talking and how many things have they said? What hashtags have they been talking about? Who has been talked about? Notice these don't have images. Uh, that's to do with the way this data is actually sent. Um, the links, this has got worse. There was a scaling issue to do with, uh, to do with URLs that I'll talk about later. So these will just say t.co, um, which, which is not particularly useful. And then a frequency graph showing a very, uh, a very definite spike when the conference actually started. Um, so just by looking at this page, we have, a, we have a much better interface on the tweets than we had in the previous version. And then up in the top left, we can export this as JSON, as CSV, or as HTML, which we previously couldn't do either. There was almost no way to get this data out in the previous iteration. Oh, I'm not in the, I'm not in PowerPoint anymore. Ah. What? There we go. I've clicked the button. Why is it not doing anything? No? Ah, ooh, what? Hooray! So, so we had this system and we thought, that's marvelous, it all works, so we gave it to a student. Um, and, or we gave it to several students actually, a small number of students and Les, um, and they created a number of tweet streams and they happily harvested tweets forever and everybody was perfectly happy uh, until we got to about 12 million tweets in the repository. We hit a number of scaling issues again. Um, really to do with the assumptions built around the platform we were using. Um, it was kind of assumed that the repository would store 
publications. Um, and ePrints didn't really have very good infrastructure for searching for 10 million objects and iterating through them to do something with them. So what happened was the database performance degraded to the point where the nightly job of generating these abstract pages was taking more than 24 hours. Um, and at that point, we had to step back and think about how we were going to manage this. And of course, the repository was still merrily harvesting, so the problem just got bigger. Um, but let's talk about some of the issues that we had. The first one was URLs. Um, our initial system would look up, would follow every URL to see where it redirected to. And this was before the days when Twitter would wrap every single URL in a t.co uh, wrapper. So, so these days, any URL you post, even if you post a short form URL like this one, it will actually get wrapped in a t.co one. And I guess Twitter are doing this to, to know how people are following links. Um, but the t.co one would resolve to this one, and then this one would resolve to something else, which might also be a redirect to somewhere else. Um, but understanding where these links are pointing to is enormously important um, to see which resources they point to. Um, but it takes somewhere in the order of one second to follow one of these links on average. We did something like 500 links in 600 seconds. Um, so this is a problem that we haven't yet solved because we've had more important things to solve. Um, it's really the, the miracle of the next design iteration. We're not going to have time to look up everything. We're going to have to find a sensible way to look up the things we think are most important. What makes it more difficult is the t.co. If, if, if I post a link to Twitter, it gets wrapped in a t.co. If Les posts the same link, it will get wrapped in a different t.co URL. So there are some challenges with, with managing this. The second issue was an issue to do with really MySQL performance and how it hit the processor. We've pretty much solved this by having an iterative process and a number of direct MySQL queries rather than going through the ePrints API. I've managed to get a process which would have taken about 36 hours down to about 45 minutes doing that, which I'm quite proud of. Um, but it took an awareness of the back-end database schema that was being used. It was, it was optimized for ePrints running on MySQL. So your mileage may vary when you come across problems like this on other repository platforms, but you're probably going to need to optimize. I think my phone is ringing. I do apologize. Let me just, let me just turn it off. I actually got about two minutes in and thought, oh, I didn't silence my phone. Oh, I won't get a call. I never get calls. Um, the third problem we have was the twilight problem. Um, our student, a, a male student, a PhD student, swears that his professor told him to harvest twilight tweets. Um, but there are, there are very significant peaks in the Twilight tweaks. For example, when the movies come out, or when the, the actors from Twilight are in other movies. I think this girl, was she in The Hunger Games too, the actress from this? No? OK, so she was in another movie, and there was a spike of tweets. And what happened is we got more than 1,500 tweets every 20 minutes. So we got this kind of crenellation pattern in our data, where we'd have a lot of tweets for the first 10 minutes of the hour, and then no tweets for the next 10 minutes of the hour, until we harvest it again, and then we get the next 10 minutes of tweets. So there's an issue there that, that can be solved by using uh, the streaming API, which just gives you this stream of data. But we, we're not at the point where we're ready to do that yet, because there are all sorts of um, real-time issues with using the Twitter API. And real-time issues are, are, are often very hard to solve. And uh, we've only just got this working. So let's talk about the future. I, I, I trawled 
uh, Wikipedia for pictures of the future, and this is the best one I found. Um, this was painted in 1900 and something, um, and it's called Going to the Opera in the Year 2000. Um, and I thought it was wonderful. Um, but what do we want to do in the future? We have, we have some issues with the current system. Um, we want to use the streaming API. We want to sensibly, uh, we want to sensibly handle URLs. But we also want to deal with a, a, a problem that's uh, a systems problem that we have, which is the unbounded nature of the system. If we set up something to harvest, and we set up something else to harvest, we don't, after a year or two, we're just getting more and more data into the system. At some point, this set of optimizations is going to break because we'll have too many tweets again, and there's no way around that. Um, we're going to need uh, a strategy for the next order of magnitude problem when we do get to it. And we haven't really even begun thinking about that yet. Uh, but it will be a problem, and it will be harder to solve than the last set of problems were because the data will be bigger. Um, but aside from this system, our goal is really harvesting social media, harvesting the important bits of the web. Um, and we've identified a few other places that we can use a system like this. Um, I, I was sat there yesterday typing up my notes, and the, Les is probably a better person to talk about this, but the ones I took off the top of my head were uh, YouTube videos with YouTube comments. There isn't currently a good way to, to archive those, and those can be quite interesting, usually quite banal. Um, but the other interesting one we had that has similar properties to, to harvesting Twitter would be harvesting uh, Google results over time. Um, and these could have enormous, uh, enormously useful social science uh, 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 uses. So finally, if you want your own one, this is the ePrints Bazaar. If you have a clean uh, Debian or Ubuntu install, I think uh, a competent sysadmin can get a Twitter harvester running, in up, running on it within about 20 minutes. So if you want one of these, you can have one. It's all, it's all out there. It's all open source. It's all free. What would you use it for? Lightweight harvesting. Uh, for non-technical people. If you, did you want to say something else, Les? I was just going to supplement. Paul Bent, your excellent comment. Um, if you have somebody who wants to just spin up a harvester and you have some ePrints experience, this could be the path of least resistance for getting that up. Yeah, so, um, so the, the real application we see, we know, we know that there are large scale you know, sort of, uh, programs for doing this kind of thing. Um, what we wanted to do was give something to students, particularly master's students perhaps is our, uh, our aim, who, who want to uh, operate in this area and social media is a big growth area for, social, for the social sciences, um, uh, but who don't have uh, experience, uh, they don't have any technical competencies particularly, their supervisors don't have technical competencies perhaps, uh, and, uh, uh, and so they just need uh, something to, to work on in, in an investigation that's going to take place over a few weeks or a, or a few months, perhaps a PhD student. Um, so uh, although we know that the, there are these scaling things that are actually really helpful because they shine a light on the assumptions that we've built into ePrints, uh, uh, of the kinds of material we weren't expecting people to put in, you know, billions of 140 character resources. Uh, so uh, that's great, but you know, from, from the point of view uh, of the educational benefits of this, you know, so that that's really what we're going for. It's for the for the medium scale for the for for students and for uh, to uh, and for uh, doctoral students to you know sort of cut their teeth in these areas. Okay, I think that's all I want to say. I think we're done. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, well, I've been watching some of the tweets from this. Would anyone not from Southampton? <laughs> no, uh, no, I'll come to you, Patrick. Uh, actually, Patrick, what would you like to? <laughs> so, um, this is a little bit cheeky since I am from Southampton. But, um, I can understand what the initial motivation for choosing ePrints for this system was, 
but now that you've got some experience and you've run into the scaling problems and you've essentially dodged the API to do some straight onto MySQL hacking, do you think in retrospect, in hindsight, you might have been better off starting from a completely blank slate and just building a lightweight application on top of MySQL rather than using the repository and have a bespoke application? I, I think that in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. I mean, what we get from the repository is the mature preservation platform. Um, and the problem is when the way everybody does this is they write a small bespoke application that throws the data somewhere in a way that's easy for them to process for the task they're doing. Um, but that's not necessarily the best way to do it for the long term. So, so repositories are, this is what repositories are supposed to do. And while there have been challenges getting this data into the repository, I think those challenges are something we have to meet uh, to, to allow repositories to serve this need. Okay, thanks very much. Anyone else for any questions for, for Adam and Les? Okay, well, thank you both very much. It was really interesting, and uh, I see that I suspect I'm going to be dropping down the rankings with the number of tweets well, that I'm I, I have seeing. to say, he has had an unfair tactical advantage because he's had an account on my Twitter harvester for about a week, so he's always known how much he has to tweet to stay ahead. But I've never used that in an inappropriate fashion. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, guys. Okay, um, we are two-thirds of